oh, stocks? Very I much so. I don't think any of us anticipated such a complete success in the mission and what we really went there for. Well, we'll get on to our questions. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've been photographed with a lot of presidents, and uh, I understand the only one you have here, uh, photograph you have here with your family is the one with Eisenhower. And why is that? Well, there happened to be two over there. And really, they're the only, uh, they came here with me. So uh, they're the, brought them from home. The one is at the dedication of the Eisenhower Medical Center in Palm Springs, and the other is uh, the president, uh, well, after he was no longer president. And uh, I was governor, but we're on the first tee of a golf course down at Palm Springs, uh, just before we set out for 18 holes of golf. Where did you shoot? Did you beat him? Uh, well, the funny thing is, I did. <laughs> but uh, that was in 1968, and uh, those, uh, those, just, those are all personal possessions, mm -hmm. and so I had Did those. he mean something special to you? I yes, I liked him very much. Yeah. I, uh, and I think he was a far better president. Uh, you know, the, it's, there's a tendency on the part of some people today to look back at the 50s as if somehow that was a kind of a in a rut period and so forth. But here's a man that is president, came into office, and already aware, as we've all been aware for the last 50 years, about government spending. Mm -hmm. And his first budget wound up being about $2 billion less than the last budget of his predecessor, President Truman. And five years later, he had a budget that was still less than that five year, that budget of five years before of Truman's. So that's one thing that you think is a, is a feather in his cap. Yes. Can you tell me, now that you, you've been here, and I know you have a sense of history because uh, I understand you laid a wreath for Will, uh, Millard Fillmore recently and whatever, do you have a sense of what president you resemble, or do you think about that? No, I actually haven't. I, re I really don't. Uh, or, or, or haven't. Uh, Do you think about your place in history? I mean, what you want it to be, what you hope it will be? I know I see references to that every once in a while, but no, you, you're so busy with what's going on and what you're trying to get done that, um, uh, you know, if I start thinking about history, I, I have to start thinking that I won't be around. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> Mr. President, I wanted to ask you, uh, does George Bush have the inside track as the next Republican president, perhaps? And do you think he's your best successor? Well, I hate to comment on that. I've always believed that since they say that in this job uh, you are the titular head of your party, uh, and I've always believed in letting the party make those decisions, mm -hmm. I would rather comment on George as what he is right now as a vice president. I happen to think that he is the greatest vice president, I think, that I can ever remember. He has been more involved in all the doings of this administration than any vice president in the past, and, um, uh, and, has, and has been successful in the things that he's been called upon to, to do. So you wouldn't have to think, take a week to think about what no. George Bush does no. for you? No. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about something uh, on prayer. I wonder, do you pray yourself specifically for people in your administration or people that, that you come in contact with? And is there a certain time of day or a certain time of the night that you, that you find yourself saying a prayer? Oh, well, there are a couple of times like that, but uh, uh, that does not complete my schedule of prayer. I find myself... Uh, turning in that direction uh, frequently. Can and you cite I, any examples? Like, uh, cite any examples? Well, I don't, I just can't believe that any of the other 38 men who've held this job could have ever held it unless they too uh, looked to prayer for help. And uh, I think Lincoln said it best of all. Someone must have asked him that same question. And his answer was that he would be the most presumptuous block, blockhead uh, on this footstool, meaning Earth, if he thought that for one day he could 
dispatched the duties that had come upon him uh, since he came to this place. Those were, he said it in the first person, I'm saying it in the third. Without the aid and the enlightenment of someone wiser and stronger than all others. Uh, yes, I ask for help, and I ask for help for others too. That uh, uh, I, I believe, I just was raised to believe very much in prayer, and I believe in intercessionary prayer. The, when I hear from so many people that tell me that in their church or in their group of friends that they pray regularly for me, I, I think I'm benefiting from that. Mm -hmm. But do you pray at a certain time of day? or do you, you know how you teach children to get up in the morning and kneel down and pray. I just wondered, do well, you have any old habits yourself? Well, I, no, I have a, a few moments there at the end of the day when uh, I think it's time to say thanks. And uh, long about early morning when you wake up and uh, the phone hasn't rung, it isn't quite time to get up, but uh, I think it's a good time for some further conversation. Mr. President, uh, you, you got a chance to see your granddaughter, Ashley. Yes. I wondered, did you spend any time together, alone? Oh, yes. How was well, it? Well, not alone. We, yes. Both the families were together, and we were all there together. And, uh, oh, she's very cute and very active, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I... Did you bring her a gift? What? Did you bring her a gift? Uh, yes. It was a stuffed animal that turned out to be bigger than she was. <laughs> <laughs> what but does she, she liked it. What does she call you? Um, actually, it was a, I don't, it, the, it was a kind of a, like a bop of sound or something that uh, she hadn't gotten around to being able to, uh, to say grandpa. You know, uh, we all have families, but because you a uh, public office, the estrangement in your family was played out in the public press. And I was wondering, as a father and a husband, what advice uh, you would give other families about mending fences and how you mended this fence? Why, well, our problem was mainly one of distance. And so mm -hmm. this time when we eliminated the distance, uh, uh, we eliminated the problem also. We, there was much love in the room and uh, put the two families together and whatever problems have been resolved. How do you deal with all those varied personalities? Uh, <laughs> speaking as a father. Well, uh, I gave an answer once to uh, someone with regard to uh, my supposed failure with uh, women in the world of politics and all, and I said, how could they, how could anyone feel that uh, I somehow was not uh, having the attitude I should have when I have two very independent daughters? <laughs> uh, I must have had something to do with that. <laughs> At your press conference the other night, Mr. President, you responded to some questions that sprung from the vigilante gunman. And when I was uh, going through some of your, your folders in the office, we noticed that, that uh, one of your biographers said that it, in the 1930s, you had foiled an armed robbery yourself. And I don't know if this incident is true, but I, I have a, a copy of what is supposed to have happened. But what happened, according to the biographer, is that uh, a woman was being stuck up outside your window. Right below my second story window. All right. Can you tell us uh, what happened? Well, I was half awake and I heard voices raised and, and, for, and, and I don't know why, but lying there half awake, I thought, you know, what if this were something and I was asked to testify, what would I say was, I thought it was a marital fight or some kind, you know, a couple having a quarrel. And I said, what would I say that I'd heard? And I, I was saying to myself, well, I heard an angry, angry tone. And then I heard this voice raised another octave and a woman's voice saying, take everything I've got, but let me go. And in about a second and a half, I was at the window. And they were right down there. My apartment was on the second floor. And he was standing there with a gun on her. And uh, she had a suitcase at her side. Turned out that she was a nurse returning to the hospital and evidently had been out on a case or something. The hospital was just down the street from my apartment. And uh, I've always had some guns around and uh, I went, started for one on the mantle and then realized I didn't have any bullets and I wouldn't do any good up there in the dark uh, to have an empty gun. It might if I was down there with him. 
and it bluffed. So I just went back to the window and uh, knowing that he couldn't see into the dark where I was and they were lighted by the street light down below, I just told him that to drop it and get going. He'd picked up the suitcase by that time. I said, drop it and get going. Or I said, I, I'm gonna blow your head off. I got a 45 up here. And he turned around and pointed the gun up and realized he couldn't see me at all there in the dark, but knew that I had to be able to see him. And I yelled, drop it. And all of a sudden he dropped the suitcase and took off and ran. Did you, did you have a gun in your hand at the time? No, when I realized that it didn't, I stopped halfway to the mantle. And when I realized I didn't have any bullets, I thought, what's the use of standing up in the dark with an empty gun? What, what would you have done if, you know, he had shot? I don't know. I've never thought about that. Maybe I'd have fired a shot to let him know I really did have a gun, if I'd had one with bullets in it. Yeah. But uh, I knew that also to, to bluff with an empty gun up there was useless because I would have to, to go down on the street there where I could actually do anything, why then there would be a period when I was away from the window and uh, nothing could be done. But do, you the, own a, do you own a handgun now? You've said you've often had them around. Oh yes, I've always been something of a collector. Up at the ranch mm -hmm. I've got a number of guns. guns. Yeah. But I must say that just recently, uh, in the last year or so, I was in Iowa and uh, for the first time saw again the young lady, because then I put on a robe and went downstairs when he ran away and walked over to the hospital with her. And I must say, she was very brave. All she was complaining about was you know, the size of him. She said he wasn't even as big as I am. <laughs> so uh, somebody had learned about that story and had found her, now a married woman, and uh, they had her present at a, one of the appearances that I made down there. And I, for the first time, got to meet her. And uh, That's good. Can, can I ask you this? Do you think that the American, the American people's reaction is understandable to this vigilante gunman? Uh, and do you think they're right or wrong to have the attitudes they do about American justice and about the American judicial system, which seems to prompt this? Well, I think there, we have been through a period where, uh, whether it was an extension of liberalism or what, it seemed that our justice system was more caring about the rights of the assailant, the criminal, and they were of the, of the victims. Mm -hmm. But I think there's been a change. I think this uh, comprehensive crime program that we've just gotten passed by Congress is evidence of that. I think the fact that neighborhood groups have formed to kind of protect their neighborhoods and call what they neighborhood watch and so forth, I but think there is a different attitude now yeah. about that. But, but are they right to have been concerned? I mean, are they right to have this kind oh, of Oh, yes. Reaction? Yes, because crime was increasing, but now for two years in a row, yeah, I, the crime I statistics, statistics have gone statistics. down. The first yeah. time they've ever done this. But crime was just uh, running away with us. And it still is to a certain extent, even with the improvements we've made. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe, I'm not going to point a finger at the police. It isn't a case of not apprehending the criminal. How about the courts? Well, this is one of the things uh, I remember as, as governor. We started some programs of this kind with regard to judges there in the state, where really most crime law enforcement takes place is it in regard to state laws. We found a judge who was himself surprised when we were able to point out to him he had never sent a person in his courtroom to prison. And uh, he, as I say, he was surprised and realized that his own, he must have a kind of inner tendency where he looked for the ways to avoid, even in conviction, sending someone to punishment. And here was an entire record. And we did some things at the state level there about getting all the facets of law enforcement together. The people that are going to take charge of the criminals after they go to prison, the judges, the people in the courtroom, the police, and mm -hmm. they all were amazed to find out that never had they ever bothered to try and understand the other fellow's problem. The policeman had his problem. He'd never gone on to, well, what is the problem of the parole board and the judge and all of this? And uh, it made a difference there. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, um, on another issue, the abortion issue, which raged during your recent election campaign, being more specific, I, I wonder what you would do if either of your daughters came to you and said they were going to have an abortion and it was not for reasons of health. 
I have to tell you that I would do everything in the world that I could to be supportive of them and to help them. And uh, I would have to urge that they not resort to that because when, again, when I was governor, legislation came up in California. This was the first time I'd ever faced the issue. And I didn't, I realized I didn't have any position on it. And when the author of the bill, because it was very controversial, mm -hmm. sent word that he would amend the bill to anything that I felt I could sign, I had a monkey on my back then, and I probably did the most soul searching and studying and interviewing and talking to others in the medical field and the clergy, mm -hmm. uh, every kind of person. And I came on my own to the conclusion that you are taking a human life. And the only way we can justify that is in self-defense. So therefore, there are way reasons whereby I would justify it if a mother has a right to protect herself. But on the other hand, uh, if the unborn child is a living human being, we, we cannot uh, go on declaring it is right simply for whim or a matter of convenience to take that life. And until and unless someone can prove that that is not a living entity, uh, then I feel that we have to oppose abortion on demand. But, but you said you would support your daughter. Now, how about if she said, I disagree with you? Then what would you do? Well, of course, in this instance, they're, they're both uh, of age and they're both married, and uh, I probably wouldn't have any authority over them. My, all I could do was be persuasive. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to ask you something you touched on earlier, which was about your relations with women. Jean Kirkpatrick, I know you have long admired and, and you have said that uh, you've applauded her intelligence and whatever. And she has said, among other things, that, that she feels that there's sexism in the State Department and in the Cabinet and even here in the White House. What is she right? Well, <laughs> uh, she may have seen evidences of it that in her view, uh, that that is true. I, I can't say that everyone uh, here in the executive branch has the same philosophy or the same viewpoint and things of that kind. Uh, if I saw any evidences of it, I wouldn't stand for it. Mm -hmm. I would uh, cancel them out. Has she ever talked to you directly and said, now there's an instance where, you know, I'm not being listened no. to or whatever. No, she has never she never has. And uh, I wasn't, uh, and I, I simply read of the fact that she'd made those remarks and mm -hmm. some address someplace, but... Um, Is it something you'd go back to her now? I mean, surely I understand you're going to talk to her later no. about a possible change in her position. Is it something that you would say to her now? I've seen published reports. Um, what about this? Well, no, if I thought there was a reason sometime where she thought she was being unfairly treated by anyone because of that, I would certainly want to know who it was and what the situation was. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it could be corrected. But I have a great admiration for her and think she has done the most remarkable job at the United Nations. Do you see her now? I understand that she wants a new post. Do you see her working for you in some other position soon? I'm certainly going to, s to try and find a place that would be suitable and worthy of her because I would like to have her continue with the administration. Would you tell us what that might be? No, I'd rather not talk about it because any time you talk about a job, you're talking about something that someone else already holds. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, as you've seen, there is just a slight bit of moving around uh, a slight in the bit. administration. <laughs> uh, many public officials uh, in government and the Supreme Court serve to 65, 70, 75 with achievement. I was wondering how you felt about mandatory retirement at 70 for the general population. Well, I know what the reason is behind mandatory yeah. retirement. And it's, frankly, it is one in which uh, it's born out of a kind of a humanitarian idea in which they say, uh, you know, true that people at certain ages are different than others. And if you don't have a mandatory age limit, then you are faced with the problem of going to some individual who actually is uh, whether chronologically or not, is too old for the, for the job and having to pick that person out and say, hey, you can't do it anymore. 
when maybe there's someone beside him doing the job just fine that, uh, that is the same age. So this is one of the reasons for the mandatory age requirement. I'm glad that it's been raised to 70 and recognizes the, the um, change in longevity that we've had. So I don't know whether I would ever suggest going out and, uh, and trying to force the private mm. sector to have that if they don't want to have it, or, some, or to cancel out some companies if they say they want to have it. Well, I wanted to ask you, following up on that, uh, obviously you've given aging people a very, very good name, but what is the worst thing about growing old? What, what do you find is the worst thing, the hardest thing about growing old? Oh, I suppose it's finding a, a few things that uh, you suddenly discover you, you can't do well anymore. Uh, Such as? Well, like um, out there playing with the new puppy on the lawn the other day, and uh, I started off at what I thought was full speed. And I used to run on a relay team and ran the quarter mile when I was young. And then I realized uh, I wasn't going to run any quarter miles anymore. But um, no, I feel so good and healthless. I suppose what I'd have to say is kind of an annoying little thing that you find yourself every once in a while, uh, you read of someone older and someone uh, who's passed on, and then you find yourself say, saying, I wonder how many more? And then you say, no, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> but uh, you start counting. So it's, it's losing some of your friends then? Yes, and uh, also saying, uh, you know, dare I dare, dare I, dare I think about uh, <laughs> how many more I may have. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a rule of thumb that I passed on to many people, mm -hmm. older or younger than I am, and that is anymore to simply say that getting old is something that happens 15 years from where you are, whatever <laughs> your age may be. That's 15 years from getting old. Down the line. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you a light, a light question, really. Uh, during the campaign, you had suggested that Bruce Springsteen sort of got at the heart of America uh, as an uh, entertainer. Can you tell us other entertainers that you think touch America, touch what's going on, touch the mood, say something that the people are trying to say? Oh, yes, and without trying to pick out any right now, let me go to the past for some. Uh, some that really just were a part of Americana. One was Irving Berlin. Uh, In what way now? Tell us. Well, look, look at that list of hits. Uh, look at his songs, which had to do with, with romance. And uh, I'll be loving you always. And the things of that kind. But also look at, uh, uh, well, God bless America. Uh, he could, and he, in two wars, he turned his talent uh, in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he wrote Yip Yip Yap Hank in World War I. That was the great Broadway musical where all the money went to Army Emergency Relief and all the personnel were military. Well, then he did This is the Army for World War II. And I was already serving, in the, I was in the service, a second lieutenant at the time, and the Army sent me back to Warner Brothers, which was the studio where I'd been under contract, to uh, be in that picture. Mm -hmm which I made at a salary of a second lieutenant because, again, all the proceeds were going to... Which was what then, Mr. Uh, President? Which was, what, what would your salary have been then? I think it was around 300 a month yeah. then. Yeah. But could I just tell you a little funny one about that? He wanted uh, Irving... There was a flashback to Yip Yip Yak Hank, Yep Hank, and he wanted to be in the picture for that part of the flashback. So there this little man stood in the World War I uniform in front of a tent and it called for him to be singing his own song of Oh How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. You know, the song that goes and uh, someday I'll, I'll kill that other pup, the one that gets the bugler up and spend the rest of my mm -hmm. life in bed. Okay. Well, he's singing that song. He was not a singer. And standing beside me on the set while it was being shot was a big husky grip I was working there. And he nudged me and he says, if the guy that wrote that song could hear him, he'd roll over in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of movies, uh, Mr. President, I was just curious if 
uh, what movies you and Mrs. Reagan have seen recently, and if there were any roles that you might have liked to have played. Well, when I was making pictures, I don't think about that much anymore. But you don't. When I was making pictures, uh, yes, I was, I was in a running battle with Warner Brothers. I was under contract there for 13 years, mm -hmm. and I was in a running battle all the time because they had me in uh, the kind of light uh, comedy, drawing room comedy type pictures, simply because that, you know, if you're in one that makes money, you're typecast from then on. Mm -hmm. And they were successful pictures. But I wanted to do some more outdoor pictures. I wanted to play the Air of Flynn type of role and so forth. In fact, I... You could show your physique, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> Did you but covet the, the Zorro roles? Huh? Or Zorro? Or uh, what well, Errol Flynn role? Well, when he played Custer. Yeah. Now, I had played the young Custer in the picture set of A Trail yeah. when he played Jeb Stewart. Yeah. And uh, then when they made The Life of Custer, and I, I was a cavalry. That was right. I was a cavalry officer. Now I wanted to play Custer, and uh, I couldn't compete with him box office wise at the time. No, he he got the role. But I remember once in an argument with Jack Warner about this. I I got furious talking to him about the roles, and finally I blurted out to him. I said, "If you ever do put me in a western, you'll make me the lawyer from the east." <laughs> 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 we, I was talking to Mayor Koch not long ago, and he said he wanted Richard Gere to play him in the movies when they shot Mayor. Can you tell us, even if it's totally outrageous, like Richard Gere playing Mayor Koch, who should play Ronald Reagan in the Ronald Reagan story, and who should play Nancy? Uh, I'd like to play it. <laughs> I'm not going to recommend a good role for his mother. <laughs> well, well, who, who should play the days back back in Il Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> the man with the gun in his hand or the, out the window saying, I'm going to blow you away. <laughs> no, I've, you know, that's impossible to think about. Uh, that question has come up before, and I have to say, uh, I've, uh, I, I've, I've never been able to think of think of the whole spectrum and say, well, well, I, I guess I've just never been able to think of somebody making a picture of my life. But uh, no, you can't think of someone that you would, it's like we're supposed to always be the worst at picking out the best photo of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I couldn't do it. Tell me this, uh, we've, uh, I think the last time I was here, I sort of asked, you know, what you saw yourself doing when you retire. Uh, or when you leave this office, I'm sure it won't be a retirement per se. Uh, you certainly must have chopped all the wood on the ranch by now. So oh, what, do you think, what do you think you might do? Well, I mean, Mrs. Reagan must have, I understand she was not for a second term initially until you convinced her, and, and maybe you'll tell us how you convinced her and what her, con what her concerns were. Oh, but I then think, what would you do? I think she was worried, as any wife would be, that, uh, that uh, maybe I'd go out as defeated and uh, as against uh, retiring voluntarily and so forth. It, there wasn't, it wasn't a, a, big, a big difference at all when she realized that, uh, heard my reasons why I thought I had to, and there was... What were thoughts. they? Give us, can you give us a Well, view? that the job wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. That uh, we had gotten a good start. I think we have. I think we've turned the whole debate in government around from how much more to spend and how many more new programs down to how much to cut. On both sides, the argument is not whether to cut spending at all. The argument now is how much to cut. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the job just wasn't finished. And the What's the most important thing for you to do between now and, and 1988? In, in your own mind, the yeah. one thing you care about? Get us back in a solid economy and get us to the point that we, if we haven't by then been able to eliminate the deficit spending, at least we could see it point a definite date at which we could say this is where it will be eliminated mm -hmm. and then set in motion a program for reducing the, the national debt and on the other the international scene to continue on what I think is well started and that is a program for peace and the goal is the ultimate elimination of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Do you ever foresee a time uh, when you or, or a circumstance when you might resign the office of presidency in midterm? No. 
unless something happened to me that I didn't think I could make it down to the office anymore. No. Can I ask him one other question? And it may not, it may not, which would be, uh, because I'm interested in your granddaughter. Is there a difference between having a grandchild and what a grandchild means to you and having a child? Is there a, is there a? Oh, yes, I, I think there is. A, I mean, what do you look for the hopes for one versus the other? What, when well, you I think the hopes are the same, but I think being a grandchild is that wonderful feeling of that you don't, <laughs> you aren't responsible for uh, uh, all the corrections and all of that, so you can just enjoy the grandchild with none of the responsibilities. Yeah. And uh, say that it's, it, yes, it's very nice. I find myself thinking in terms of uh, their future and uh, what they're going to do and anything that I can do here. I know that we're supposed to go, but I just, I shouldn't do this. It doesn't come. I was hoping election. And uh, out there, several rows out. And I shouldn't tell it. It isn't becoming coming from me, but it so set me up. She resolved the age issue. She was about six or seven rows back there in the crowd, and she was holding a placard like so many people do, and this one was homemade. And the placard said, he ain't old, he's cute. <laughs> and all I know is that I was set up for a week ahead. <laughs> Never got to meet her or thank her or anything for it, but uh, if she reads this, she'll know that the... Uh, You'll have a know. lot of women writing in <laughs> saying it was me. <laughs> thank you. You've been so gracious. Well, a, a pleasure. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Good luck. Don't walk Ooh, away with... I <laughs> always... I did that last week. How do I do it? That way? Are you, you should be a professional. Yes. Down. Thank you. All down.